poltergeist. The word conjures up images of satanic demons and mischievous ghosts. For thousands of years, people have told tales of such spirits. But what exactly is a poltergeist? Is it a ghost? Or is it the manifestation of a living person's psychic energy? Those who say they have encountered poltergeists find the answers elusive and the questions haunting. Stories span from a quaint New England inn to a farm in the mountains of Oregon, where poltergeists captivate witnesses with noisy disturbances and physical activity. Patrons of a country music bar in Kentucky wonder if poltergeists are malevolent forces influenced by murder. While a scientist refuses to let fear stand between him and the true origins of poltergeist activity, perhaps there are earthly explanations for poltergeist events. But to those who have witnessed these unnerving phenomena, they remain strange, sometimes terrifying, and completely unexplained. John Stone's Inn lies in the countryside village of Ashland, Massachusetts, 30 miles southwest of Boston. It appears to be home to poltergeists, noises and movements that some think are caused by ghosts. It was here in March of 1976 that Robin Hicks' view of the world changed forever. The inn's attic used to contain apartments, where Robin spent nights with his wife. On this night, they heard strange noises. And it was a, a little girl bouncing a ball. La, 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 Down the hall. And I ran out the door, and down the stairs, and all around the building, and checked every door, and it was closed. A couple of days later, a friend of mine who was walking by said, Did you have, is your niece here the other night? And I said, No, why? He said, Well, I saw a little girl looking out your window. Robbins was not the only account of the mysterious appearance of a little girl. They used to talk about the little girl who danced, and you'd come in in the morning, and it's an old building, so you'd hear things, and you'd think, you know, it's creaking. I mean, normally that's what you would think. Well, this one day, it wasn't creaking. I don't think so. It was like really tip, 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 like that. You'd listen, and you'd say, what is that? I guess it was a little girl dancing upstairs. The inn's owner at the time was beginning renovations. He noticed that doors, locked the night before, were found open the next morning and lights, turned off, were later seen blazing in the dark. His staff was also encountering strange forces. One night after a busy night, all the waitresses were sitting around the table and I was with them and they were counting their tips and uh, getting ready to go home. And the floors in the, in the inn creak <laughs> quite readily, especially when it's real quiet. Um, you can hear it and so when someone walks by you, you can hear the creak and you get a little breeze that goes by and uh, we had that experience but there was no one else in the restaurant but us and uh, they quickly gathered up their money and, and left that night. The staff at John Stone's Inn began sharing their eerie stories of portentous encounters. My car was parked over there where that truck is parked and I walked this way and I glanced back up at the building just to see if there was anybody around. And I looked up at the window on the left-hand side and I saw that greenish white ball of light. And I went over to my car and then drove up here, got out and glanced back up at the window, saw the light again, and then the light disappeared. And the room was dark. Some staff members claim to have had startling physical encounters with the spirit. Kitchen workers were relaxing one night when an unseen force startled them by levitating a pack of cigarettes and propelling it across the table. Similar stories of playful poltergeists began to flourish. Stories of lively forces mischievously pushing waitstaff in the basement. Of the sounds of footsteps. Of extinguished candles inexplicably relighting. And of the incessant strange apparitions. We would always close off this one particular room at one point in the night. And in that room, I saw something go by the window. And it wasn't um, blurry or fuzzy or sheer as you would imagine a ghost to be. So I flung open the door and I said to what I thought would be a human, Hey, what are you still doing in? And before I could finish my sentence, I noticed there was nobody in there. And unfortunately, I spun on my heel and got out of the room rather than enter it, because I know it's a friendly ghost. Not everyone would assume that the ghosts here were friendly. The inn's history 
well known in the area, is steeped in murder and deception. Captain John Stone built the inn in 1832. His patrons were young railway workers with little else to do except drink and gamble. This often led to violence, and legend has it that Stone himself killed a traveling salesman during a card game and buried his body in the basement. Stone and the salesman are said to be two of the spirits who have haunted the inn ever since. The inn has seen its share of tragedies, including the deaths of two people who were killed on the nearby railroad tracks, one a former manager and the other a little girl, both of whom are said to be haunting the inn. You know, instead of just calling them ghosts, I kind of, I feel like I understand them a little bit more. And I also understand that they're very dangerous. We used to take them very lightly because we didn't understand what they were before. And we had a lot of fun with them. But now I think of them in a more serious nature and that uh, they're, they really shouldn't be fooled with. They're very powerful and very dangerous things. Spiritualist Raphael Bibbo, intimately familiar with the inn's history and structure, feels that the sheer number of reports of poltergeists at the inn are enough evidence to conclude that paranormal activity is present. And with so many people who have had these uh, experiences, one cannot say that 75 percent of the public is paranoid or has some, got some problems with them because uh, there are a lot of credible people who have experienced, felt, seen, touched, and so you have to go on that basis that something must exist, something has to exist. Unlike the apparitions associated with hauntings, poltergeists are phenomena involving real-life physical activity. Is the building itself a source of these activities? The inn, uh, the thing that first caught me right off was that it's only about 50 or 100 feet away from the, from the railroad tracks, and that's going to cause some pretty serious shaking of that building. Could the force of a passing train last long after the train has left, resulting in residual vibrations in the building? Could these have a significant impact on old walls and floors, resulting in unexpected sounds and movements? When there is movement between a beam and a post, for example, it will make a noise. Also, as it expands and contracts, the boards sitting on top of the uh, beams will creak, they'll make noises, they'll be noises like clunks and bangs and things like that that can easily be translated as footsteps. Local historians point out that there is nothing in their records indicating any kind of paranormal reports at the end since it was built. Well, as you learn in stuff like this, there's so much hearsay. As far as the paranormal stuff, no, the, there are no written records in town of anything unusual, except possibly we look research where a young girl was killed by the train. That might be attributed to the ghost they talk about. Most of the people who visit or work at the inn are aware of its history of alleged hauntings and poltergeists. Are they simply misinterpreting a natural occurrence as a paranormal experience? When you do a magic trick, there, there, is one, there is the way the trick goes in real life, and then there is the way that the people remember it. So when they remember something, it's much better than it ever was when it was performed. And it's the same type of thing, I believe, with, uh, with sightings and paranormal activity like that. If you're, if you're in a receptive state of mind already to begin with, you will believe it. You will look for things and make connections that may or may not be there. Whether the poltergeists are real or not, one thing is certain. As long as the walls of John Stone's Inn stand, the stories will never die. Many experts on paranormal events agree that children and adolescents can be magnets for poltergeist activity. Are children lightning rods for the paranormal? Frank and Jackie Walker raised their daughters Tara and Devin in a farmhouse in the Oregon mountains. The Walker's home, nestled in Kings Valley, lies on property once owned by its namesake, Isaac King, who was found shot to death in his barn in 1866. And there are three stories. One, uh, the newspaper announced that he'd shot himself. Um, uh, but then another one said, well, no, it was an accident. And then the third one is that he was murdered by members of his family. No one knows. No one will ever know. Well-known local legend has it that King's ghost haunts the property on which the walkers now live. As soon as they moved in, Tara and Devin immediately felt they were not alone in their new home. They sensed something immediately when we moved in. I remember Tara and Devin, Tara first, telling me that she heard things. She heard footsteps. 
and I just said, well, it's an older house. We had a new home before, and this is an older home, and they, there are noises that are unexplainable sometimes in older homes. But she said, Mom, I think this, there's somebody here because I hear footsteps. Devin, seven years old at the time, told her parents that she also sensed an unknown presence. I just felt like someone was always watching me and, like, there. I just noticed that doors were shutting, no one was there, things were creaking in the hall. It was just kind of spooky, and then all these other things started happening, and I just felt that there was something there. Her older sister, Tara, observed several strange events that led her to believe she and her family were surrounded by spirits. And I guess the reason I believe in ghosts is because we moved here is because of all the strange happenings that have occurred. Doors slamming when no one's there, voices in the hallway when no one's there, footsteps when no one's there, stuff like that. Frank and Jackie dismissed these tales, concluding their daughters were anxious about their new surroundings. Then, one night, the parents experienced something unusual. During a dinner party, a guest uttered the word ghost. The TV came on, the water faucet started up in the kitchen full blast, and the cat food container was dumped in the middle of the utility room floor. We talked about it later, Frank and I, and we decided that we'd better listen to our children. <laughs> the disruption seemed to be the work of an intelligent force with its own agenda. I remember my mom, she was getting mad at us because we were fighting over something, I can't remember what it was. We were fighting over the TV control or something. My mom said, go to your room. And when we went there, when I went there, the door was locked to my room. The hinges were inside the door. There's no way anybody else locked it. My dad wasn't home. The mischievous actions of the poltergeist seem to reveal a prankish sense of humor. One day, Frank discovered that a critical document he needed for work was missing. The walkers searched the home and office frantically until it turned up in a very unlikely spot. It was stacked underneath two other boxes, and lo and behold, the report was on the top of that box. And none of us had taken it over there. The girls had their own separate drawing area. There's no way they could have lifted the heavier boxes and inserted it. I had some angry words at that point. I asked the spirit to please leave us alone and stop hiding things. I actually just came out and said, whatever you are, please stop it. Frank's outburst appears to have transformed the poltergeist activity from mischievous to helpful. Suddenly, it was opening the gate at the farm's entrance for approaching cars and unlatching deadbolt locks on doors for Frank when he had forgotten his keys. He asked my mom and my sister and me if we had opened it, and we said no. So we hope it's the ghost who answered it. We think it is. Still curious, Frank and Jackie called on ghost hunters Dave Esther and Sharon Gill. Dave and Sharon use an array of devices to collect evidence of the existence of ghosts. I believe in ghosts because I've seen them, I've heard them, they're real. You can measure, you can use physical instruments, scientific tests that can determine the mass, the energy, presence. Supernatural is not natural occurring. You can document it, measure it. Everybody thinks you need special equipment to do this, and that's absolutely not true. Um, you can even use Polaroid. I got a couple that had uh, different sort of swirls. Miss Jackie has gotten several like that as well. But that one particular day, behind her daughter standing in the office, there was a misty. It almost looked like it distorted the center of the picture. Dave and Sharon felt that the combination of photographic evidence, thermal readings, and the first-hand accounts were proof that a spirit was present. Because the idea of having a resident spirit was initially unsettling to the walkers, Dave and Sharon talked with them about their concerns. They felt very comfortable with us. Um, they started watching for things and, and noting things that were happening and realized that they were not malevolent in nature. They were being more protective than anything. Having spent years trying to quantify spirit activity and researching the history of paranormal outbursts, Dave and Sharon understand the potential connection between poltergeists and adolescents, something the girls find both comforting and exciting. According to the ghost hunters, at least I think that's what they said, is that kids can sense the entities better than grown-ups. Is there truly a relationship between poltergeist activity and adolescent children? The classic poltergeist is a, um, a center of um, funny physical happenings, particularly object movements and um, percussive sounds, you know, raps and whatnot. 
um, the centre being around an individual, often an adolescent, but not always. It wouldn't be without parallel for a rather isolated family with several children to develop poltergeist phenomena. Now, whether the emotional state triggers it off at the beginning in some way, and then when it happens, adds to it and feeds backwards and forwards, we don't know. But the emotional state is in the person who's seeing the things around which they are happening. I don't think it's got anything to do with spirits at all. Poltergeist researchers feel that the emotional turmoil of adolescence can generate enough psychic energy to trigger poltergeist activity. Psychologists argue that reports of poltergeist are simply people's misinterpretations of ambiguous situations. Possibly what is being taken as a poltergeist may indeed be a prank. In this case, where you have little girls, it seems to me that, that they started as a prank. They may even have started, after that, started to believe in it themselves. It's the kind of game that you play, and you keep on doing it, and you, you get to a point where you can of forget how it all started, and it takes on a life of, of its own. And it doesn't seem unlikely that you might be able to convince your parents of the same. Phenomena that seems to be centered around adolescence seems to reflect adolescence itself. Here we have little prankster things happening, doors opening and closing. Objects that should be in one place are found in another. And we have to ask ourselves, is this really the action of a ghost or more of the action of the adolescent? Another explanation is more mundane. The plumbing is noisy. Old plumbing systems in particular, but plumbing systems in general, uh, can transmit voices. Uh, it is not unusual for people in single-family homes for people in one home to hear voices of their neighbors coming through a plumbing system. There is also a scientific explanation for the strange way the walker's gate at the farm's entrance occasionally opens when a car approaches it. As the wind tries to go around a solid body like a car or a building or something like that, the wind sort of piles up behind it and as it tries to go around it speeds up. So if you drive up to something like a gate, the wind coming around the car will speed up and that can put more force on the gate and cause the gate to have the appearance of opening up uh, automatically. The walkers still believe they are at the center of paranormal activity and the girls, for their part, strongly defend their beliefs. I would say if you think I'm nuts, <laughs> then you can come over to our house and you'll think you're nuts too. Love, murder, and betrayal, major themes in country music, are also the key ingredients to an ongoing series of poltergeist reports at Bobby Mackey's Music World, a popular honky-tonk in Wilder, Kentucky, across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio. Country singer Bobby Mackey opened the club in 1978. His wife Janet, pregnant at the time, was apprehensive about the move. When she first saw the building, she sensed a malevolent force. I was hesitant about even wanting a nightclub to begin with. But when I saw that door open by itself, I really, I, that freaked me out. But when we got inside, the lights kept coming on and off by herself, and uh, I could hear people talking. Shortly after the Mackeys began renovation of the club, Janet claims she was physically attacked by a ladder. And here comes this ladder. It was like somebody walking right toward me. And then when I got almost right directly toward me, in front of me, it started falling toward me. And then when it did, Carl grabbed me and jerked me off from under it, and it fell. And if I hadn't stopped and done what I'd done, got her out of the way, that ladder had marched up and actually tipped over by itself. I could not find an explanation for that. I know there was something evil here. In the 1930s, a woman named Johanna committed suicide here after the murder of her lover, a singer named Robert Randall. Local folklore held that she haunted the building, searching for her slain lover. Intrigued by all the reports of this evil presence, author Doug Henry